Hi, everyone. Delighted on this episode to be talking with comics creator, author, Bob Greenberger. Bob, thank you for jumping in, taking some time and talking with me today. My pleasure. Happy to be here. Well, well, thanks so much. I am going to start out by saying you actually were involved in the first comic that I ever read. Really? Yes. You did a, a backup story. It was Batman Annual number 12, I believe. Is uh, the, one. the only Jason Todd solo story before he died. Yes. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. That would be the one. Yeah, that was the first ever comic that I remember uh, experiencing. I was in the hospital and my parents bought me this stack of comics. And the major like A story um, was Mike Barron. And the B side of the tape was uh, a story from you. So you yeah. were right there at the beginning of my reading. One of the off. very few stories I wrote. Interesting. Yeah, yeah. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. And um, of course, you're also known as a, an editor editing works like uh, Suicide Squad and uh, some of those titles through that time as well. Mm -hmm. Doom Patrol being one of those as well. Um, and you have written in the transmedia world, writing oh. novels and adaptations and uh, all of those sort of things. So curious to ask you about many of those areas in your career. What specifically do you want to know? Well, I, I usually like to start out with sort of a general question, because as I mentioned, I'm a high school English teacher. You're also a high school teacher. You yes, I this. am. High school English, grades 9 and 10 this year. Wonderful, wonderful. I'm 10 and 11, grades mm -hmm. 10 and 11. Um, and so I typically like to ask about what connects folks with storytelling, because that seems to be part of my day job, which is always trying to connect people to the written word. You know, I remember... As a young, very young child, um, being drawn to the stories of the cartoons, um, more the, you know, the first real TV show I remember watching other than a, a, a pre-K show called Ding Dong School uh, was one called Astro Boy, the, mm -hmm. the famous Osama Tezuka. Um, and they were stories and they were fanciful and they captured my imagination. And I was always seeking out other stories like that, uh, other cartoons, M much as I enjoyed the Bugs Bunny Looney Tune stuff. Uh, I definitely gravitated more to the slightly longer form adventures of, of stories. They, they opened up the world to me, I guess. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And then, um, like you, I was uh, homesick with bronchitis when I was six years old and mom brought me a Superman comic and mm -hmm. it was like Dorothy opening the door, arriving at Oz and the world was in color all of a sudden. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's funny how many folks have that story of like, I was sick as a kid and somebody in my life brought me oh, comics. Yeah. Yep. yeah. You know, so stories always were one of the key elements, you know, it, you know, looking good was fine. But it had to have stories and characters that really captured me. Yeah. And I guess that has continued through to this day. And I try and get my students to focus on the fact that if you find relatable characters or stories it, that capture you, you can lose yourself in a book. Because every August when we begin the school year, they say to me, I hate reading. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So my attitude is always, you're reading the wrong thing then. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I, I don't know about you, but I try to bring in comics or superheroes or popular characters when I can. Oh, if it absolutely. it feels like it. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, totally. You know, we just finished the mythology unit, we, you know, which had touched on the hero's journey. And trust me, there was a lot of pop culture in there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, you, you look at like Zeus, Odysseus, Beowulf. I mean, these are some of the oldest superhero characters that are out there. Mm -hmm. No question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now you, as I mentioned, have also created in worlds of prose with comics adaptations and with um, standalone stories that feature popular characters. So I'm, I'm curious about what that's like as an author. You know, I was trained as a journalist and always thought I'd wind up in newspapers or magazines uh, with comics as my hobby. But when I was getting out of college in 1980, the only place that uh, made me a job offer was Starlog Press. And suddenly I'm writing about 
comics and science fiction and horror uh, for Starlog and then the comic scene, which I created for them. And that got me into contact with the people at DC and Marvel. But uh, DC wound up making me an offer to come over as an associate editor. And that put me in a whole creative world I wasn't really thinking I'd be in. So on the one hand, as a comic book fan growing up, it was like dream come true time. But it also exposed me to a creative process I didn't anticipate being caught up in. Um, so I was very hesitant to tackle fiction at first. So when uh, Dave Stern, the editor at uh, Pocket Books, uh, invited me into a collaborative Star Trek novel, it was really an uh, interesting way for me to try writing fiction because I was surrounded by three other professional writers, actually four, no, three writers, sorry. Uh, three other writers who would then be able to show me the ropes and cover up my mistakes and give me a real taste of what prose writing was going to be like. And it was a process. There, there, I made mistakes. There were aborted projects. Uh, but starting with the media tie-in stuff, one, it meant I was playing in sandboxes I knew intimately well, and I didn't have to stop and create from the ground up. Uh, it was a really good training ground. And then I'm writing characters I grew up on. How, how cool is that? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I love the idea of writing as a process as well um, and going through the steps and, and all of those pieces. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, as a comic book editor, one of my favorite aspects of it was the collaborative process, sitting around with the writer and the artists saying, all right, what are we going to do for the next storyline and beating it out? And that translated itself to the collaborative process on that first Star Trek Next Generation novel. Mm -hmm. And um, that's why I've done a fair number of collaborations over the years, because I enjoy that back, give and take back and forth. Yeah. Uh, now, you've also done at least a couple of film adaptations as well. Well, the only straight film adaptation I've done was the uh, Hellboy 2 uh, mm -hmm. the Golden Army novelization. Uh, everything else has been tie-in related to a film. Mm -hmm. um the caveat there is uh when peter david had a stroke uh while he was writing the novelization of after earth mike freeman and i stepped in to finish it for him mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it was mostly his yeah, yeah and i guess i'm thinking also the the batman animated adjacent work that you uh, well, well. I did the one comic book uh for uh batman the brave and the bold Mm -hmm. uh, which I was hoping would lead to more, but then the editor left and they can't, they canceled the book and it just never materialized. Yeah. Yeah. I, I've really enjoyed the takes on that character through the different ways that animation has been applied. But um, yeah, yeah. I'm so glad to see your history with that character. Norm Brayfogel was the the person that got to bring your story to life in that first issue that I mentioned. For yeah, me. <laughs> I mean, again, that was on the early end of Norm's career. He was getting his feet wet, drawing Batman stuff before becoming the regular artist on Detective. He was young and he was enthusiastic. I remember um, his agent, Mike Friedrich, introduced us at a convention. Uh, we always got along, uh, although oddly, when we did that story, I wrote the script. Danny O'Neill sent it to Norm. He drew it. It got printed. I never talked to him about it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's I guess how the collaborative process works sometimes. That well, absolutely. Especially you know there are writers like Neil Gaiman who insist on knowing who their artist is to write to that artist's strengths. Mm -hmm. Back in the eighties and earlier, you pretty much just wrote the script, gave it to the editor, and hoped for the best. Yeah, yeah. Now you also were in the editing role, as I mentioned, oh, yes. and as you were talking about, uh, and you got to work with folks like John Ostrander, of all yeah. people, with uh, the Suicide Squad, which still just, I was rereading some issues earlier this week, and it just stands up over time. Well, thank as, you. Yeah, it's a, it's a great work. Um, well, so, I think there, John, tra you know, just as I trained as a journalist, John was a playwright at first. Uh -huh, uh -huh. and brought a lot of that theatrical element to the characters and the group dynamic in the Suicide Squad. And he had a fresh take on those characters, having not written them for the last 20 years, um, as has happened on other, you know, team books and all. And John and I were able to mix and match characters uh, to come up with a dynamic where we had some fallen heroes, some hoping for redemption, some criminals who 
just were downright evil. Uh-huh. And, you know, how, how do you, you know, watch each other's back when you can't trust them? Yeah. yeah. It was that, tremendous fun. And I think one of my favorite characters that came out of that whole series, I don't know if he existed before then, but the Bronze Tiger character was just. Yeah, the Bronze Tiger was me. created by Denny O'Neill uh, for uh, the novels he wrote under a pen name uh, featuring the Richard Dragon character. Then mm-hmm. when Dr- Richard Dragon Kung Fu Fighter went from the novels published by warner books uh you know a sister company to dc in the 1970s it became richard dragon kung fu and ben turner the bronze tiger was introduced there and mm-hmm. pretty much had vanished after that book ended until then he used him to kill the kathy kane batwoman character and an issue with detective then vanished again until pretty much john and i brought him back yeah yeah but I, I love that. Uh, there, there's just something about that character that I enjoy. And I love the just on the spot history that, you know, about all of these characters and uh, the way that all of it came to be. Yeah. You know, you read these often enough. You write about them. You talk about them. You yeah. know, they stick. Yeah. Uh, I always like to kind of hear about and point out the positive collaborations because I've invited a lot of folks on this podcast and everyone's been kind. I'm assuming the folks that aren't as kind haven't responded or (laughs) are just busy. Um, But I mentioned a couple there with Norm Brayfogel, John Ostrander. Mm -hmm. Uh, Curious about other folks that have been particularly positive collaborations and also folks that as an editor, you're you're just proud of to see how they sort of grew after working with you. Oh, OK. Well, you know, every time I was handed a book as an editor or I helped create a title uh, for DC to launch, uh, it was really important for me to put all the collaborators together in a room, take them to lunch, meet at a convention, you know, wh- wherever we can arrange it and try and make magic happen and try and get everybody on the same page and have the co- the writer and the artist speak to one another to try and make sure that, you know, they both sold the series uh, the same way. Um, when it happens with uh, J- John Ostrander, Luke McDonald, and Carl Kiesel on Suicide Squad, it was an amazing magical experience uh-huh. where John and Carl kept spinning out ideas. And every now and then Carl said, I'm uh, sorry, Luke McDonald would say, I'd like to draw this. John said, great, I'll put it in the next issue, you know. But, you know, Luke was just happy to draw and sit back and hear the guys go back and forth. On the other hand, when I inherited uh, Doom Patrol, Steve Mm -hmm. Lytle was just leaving the series. I was being handed this brand new kid named Eric Larson, who I hadn't met yet. Mm -hmm. And Eric, Paul Kupperberg, the writer, and I met at San Diego and we had a dinner. And it was clear from the get go, they saw the book in different ways. And yeah. Paul was being very proprietary because he was a major Doom Patrol fan, had written a previous incarnation of the book. He had been waiting for this book to come along because Steve Lytle took forever and a day to draw each issue. And, you know, so that, you know, he had been living with it and he had very clear ideas where the book was going. And Eric just wanted to blow things up and have, you know, which is why the first villain he created was Shrapnel for the book where uh-huh. he just exploded and all. Um, but they kept clashing heads until finally um, Eric quit. Yeah. He said this wasn't working for him and he was starting to get other offers based on what he'd been doing for the uh, Doom Patrol. Numbers had been tanking for whatever reason. And as the editor, my job was to make it commercially viable, make it profitable for the company. Mm -hmm. And I think as the editor, my job I decided was I needed a clean sweep. I needed to have a whole new creative team come in. And one of the hardest days of my life as an editor at DC was taking Paul, who I've known since we were like 14 years old together. Yeah, yeah. To lunch to say, I have to take you off the book. Yeah. And he accepted it, not happy. Uh, By then I had already um, found Grant Morrison to come in and be the new writer. Mm -hmm. And he had this amazing vision in this like 20 page proposal and i used that to get me get richard case to sign on to be the artist and then uh scott hannah was going to ink it after carlos garzon did a couple of issues and richard and scott just bonded and had a great time um 
Grant was in Scotland, and of course, transatlantic calls were expensive back then, so we didn't talk that often. Uh, he hadn't come out to any of the shows, so we couldn't do the same sort of collaboration. But yeah. Richard and Grant, through Grant's original vision, came together and collaborated wonderfully, and even though it was at a distance. I don't know how often they spoke back then. I'm sure a couple of times. Um, but they, you know, they had this very long-lived collaboration that was proved very successful. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that run, the Grant Morrison and Richard Case take on uh, Doom Patrol is pretty legendary. As yeah. Well. yeah. Um, one of the surprising bits of collaboration was uh, I inherited Warlord and Michael Fleischer was writing it. And Ron Randall had been drawing it for a while and he was going to come off the, the title. Um, other things had come up. And I uh, tapped uh, the gender Sema, who was coming off Arion. I said, you know, Jen, you'd like you to draw Warlord. And she asked if her husband, Tom Mandrake, could ink her because this way they can get it done. And they were very excited about working together. And and I took Michael and Jan and uh, Tom to lunch. Mm -hmm. And Michael had been writing for DC since the um, 19, mid 70s, you know, when he started for the company. And he sat there stunned because apparently no editor had taken him out to lunch with the right talent, be uh, the artists before. And yeah. he was sitting there listening to Jan and he was getting excited in ways he hadn't been before because he was just writing the script and was sent it to, his, you know, uh, Ross Andrew and then Denny O'Neill as the editors. And they just sent it to the artist. And that was that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But to sit there and go back and forth with Tom and Jen coming up with new corners of Skatoris to visit. It was very exciting for them. And, and I think I got some really good stories out of him as a result. Yeah. yeah. You know, the book only less than 10 issues. No, 11 issues with the two of them, uh, three of them, I should say, uh, as the creative team, but they were really good. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, and you've said a couple of things there that are so important to the editing role, which is fostering that collaboration and also having those difficult conversations when it's clear that people have other things in mind. And mm -hmm. uh, shout, shout out to Eric Larson for going and, and doing the amazing things in comics that he's done and, and Paul Kupperberg as well for being uh, an epic creator. So, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and shout out to you as the editor for... <laughs> managing the relationships and directions of the titles and characters but that's that's the job and every mm -hmm. title you you have it's different sometimes you have to be the bartender who listens to everybody's tales of woe other times you have to be the bartender who knows when to cut them off right right and other and and other times you have to sit there and carefully mix the cocktail in front of them make sure you have the right proportions of you know the ingredients and other times you just sit back and watch yeah and you have to know which is which. Yeah. Great metaphor. Great metaphor. Um, so by means of a, a final official question, and then we can <laughs> hit anything that we missed. Sure. Uh, I always like to ask about creative directions that folks are taking now. And you are talking about um, working with high school students and being an adjunct professor. And I mean, the creativity that that takes alone. Uh, every day is sort of that you, you can't do the cocktail metaphor in quite the same way, but managing those relationships is absolutely uh, part of that as well. So curious about the author and creating teaching that's currently part of your, your life. The high school classes, as you know, you know, have their own identity. So I've got mm -hmm. three sophomore classes and they all have different vibes to them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one tries my patience on a daily basis and the other two are, are okay. Could mm -hmm. be better uh, when I'm delivering the same material, but I know where I need to hype things up and, you know, get them excited about what it is we're doing or, or give them foundational background that I, I'm surprised they don't already know. Uh, stuff that I thought they learned in the classes down the hall. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, you know, like this week, one of the kids was complaining to me. He says, you know, the English classes, uh, my American lit class is feeling like a history class. I said, you have to know when these stories were written, why they were written. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I, and I point out to them, you have to understand the context um, so that as we're going through the errors, 
you understand that Walt Whitman wrote a poem that Langston Hughes responded to 50 years later. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then again, uh, Julia Alvarez responded in her own way 40 years after that. I mean, there's this ongoing dialogue in story and song and poetry and, and you know, as attitudes and, and uh, things change and you, these can't work in a vacuum. So yes, history is a part of it. And I have to explain this to them on a regular basis, how it all connects or the religious illusion. So I say, remember in history, a religion class, you learned about the Trinity or, you know, the Adam and Eve story. Oh yeah. All right. All right. Uh, what's different is um, I'm adjuncting this semester as, uh, at the Maryland Institute College of Art. It's a senior level course on making graphic novels. And I'm putting my comic book editor hat back on. And once again, I'm working with uh, 17 students producing 30 page graphic stories. And so I'm going through the basics of, you know, um, their page layouts or their um, story structure. Uh, and it's like, this is really exciting because I haven't done this sort of thing in a while. Yeah, yeah. So it's a whole different vibe. And yet they're still students. So <laughs> they right. they fall behind. They want extensions. They've got excuses. They show up without a, no explanation. <laughs> College students never want extensions, right? That's not. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I know that's well. December 13th. I'm getting what I get on December 13th and grading based on that extension or no. That's yeah. You, as you mentioned, you got to know when to cut it off. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, they stopped paying me after the 13th. So I stopped, you know, not caring, but stop uh, listening to the excuses. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you, you only have so long to get those grades in, too. Exactly. The deadlines are there. And that's, uh, you know, 17, 30 page stories. I have to carefully review the finished product. And, and you know, given everything we talk about week to week, because uh, we're in class basically from four to nine every every Wednesday night. Uh-huh. Um, you know, did they take my advice? Did they learn from the experience? Do I see growth from week one to week 14? Uh, you know, this, so there it's one on one collaboration, me and them. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you and I live a similar life in exploring American literature, too, because I've been asking my students to compare Holden Caulfield and Emerson and Thoreau and that that ongoing story. So much appreciation there on the education side as well. Yeah. You know, for me, as, as we look at some of these older classic works and we know what we know, um, you know, I, I tell some of my kids, you know, some of these books have sort of aged out. Mm hmm. Uh, and in some ways, given what we know now about people's mental health and uh, the need for resources, I stopped finding Holden a really interesting character as instead I'm indicting the parents for not getting him the help he needed. Yeah, true enough. True enough. And, uh, you know, uh, as my some of my kids are picking uh, To Kill a Mockingbird for um, independent literary analysis project and given all the discussion in the last couple of months about Mockingbird being no longer appropriate, uh, making uh, students of color uncomfortable with mm-hmm. the white savior concepts. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like, I I am sympathetic to that, but it's still, there's so much good writing and character in there. Yeah, it's You know, if you accept it with the context of the times, because she wrote it in the 50s based on Emmett Till, but it was also a Valentine to her childhood of the Depression. Yeah. This is how things were back then. And yeah. you know, we accepted for that. You know, it's an ongoing conversation. It is. It is. Absolutely. And it's not the only story. We've got Ralph Ellison. We've got. Oh, yeah. Um, Richard Wright and other folks. We've got Zora Neale Hurston, but definitely a story that holds up and has part of the conversation. I love her stuff. Oh, yeah. And I'm glad she's been sort of rediscovered over the last, you know, 20 years. Yeah. Shout out to Alice Walker there. All the literary right. shout outs here from Eric Larson to Alice Walker. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Not your typical podcast. True, true, very true. Uh, well, well, I'll take that as a compliment. I hope, and I yeah. won't keep you any longer than promised. But uh, wonderful conversation, well, Bob. I'm um, always happy to talk about the creative process, and uh, when my worlds can combine like this, it's sort of a treat. 
Yeah, yeah. It, it's all creating and writing and analyzing and all of the the funsy kinds of stuff. So oh yeah, totally. Yeah, yeah. Um, final final question is: If folks out there want to connect, see your work, uh, follow along, find out about your teaching. Uh, in the world of comics, any resources, websites? Well, the, the media? best place for all of that is uh, my website, www.bobgreenberger.com. Mm -hmm. um, there is a page with all of my books on it, with links to um, pages about all the comics I've written or edited. I, I'm trying to finish out that part of my, my life. Uh, I made a new year's promise to blog re weekly failed miserably, but I still <laughs> blog a few times a month. I hope yeah, uh, yeah. where I periodically talk about the creative process or the teaching process, what's going on. Um, the rest of the time I, you know, pimp my books. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's, it's a great way to, to live and to do. Um, yeah. Well, well, thank you for the work you're doing in education. Thank you for oh. Suicide Squad, Doom Patrol, and Batman Annual Number 12. Well. <laughs> My pleasure, Jason. <laughs> Thanks so much. All right.